Welcome to this ExecRank Continuing Board Education Program. This program is worth three credits. This is the Continuing Board Education segment on the Board's role in M&A strategy and decision making. This program discusses how the Board of Directors assists and play a part in M&A activity of a company. Speaking with us today is Ken Smith. Ken has practiced as a strategy consultant for over 25 years, beginning with McKinsey & Company and later with c -Core Consulting, Canada's leading strategy boutique, where he was a managing partner and chair of the board. His client work and research interests have been focused on M&A and corporate governance. He has published numerous articles on M&A governance and public policy issues, including his article, Losing Ownership Control, in the Harvard Business Review, and an upcoming CPA publication on the board's role on M&A. Much of his work is included in his book, The Art of M&A Strategy, with Alexandra Reed Lajou, a McGraw-Hill publication. Ken has also been active in corporate governance as a director and an advisor to boards. Ken's education and professional qualifications include a PhD in mathematics and an MBA from the University of Toronto. He is an accredited director with both the Institute of Corporate Directors in Canada and the American College of Corporate Directors. Ken also teaches the M&A course in the Rotman MBA program from time to time as a sessional lecturer. Thank you so much, Ken, for speaking with us today. Oh, my pleasure, Rachel. It's, it's an important subject, and I'm uh, glad to have the opportunity to discuss it with you. Perfect. So I will have us get started on our first question here, which is, what are some fundamental M&A concepts that every director should understand? Well, the stakes are often high in M&A, uh, and each step of the process has been the source of some M&A disasters. So effective oversight of M&A, in my view, requires an understanding of the entire process from strategy to implementation. So let, let me explain. So first, the M&A strategy. Uh, there needs to be one before any specific deal is considered. Directors should understand how M&A will advance the strategy of the company. For example, is M&A required for the strategy to succeed, or is it just an option? Uh, what types of companies or combinations will create value? What are the screening criteria? Should the company be a buyer or a seller? These are all questions about the M&A strategy that should be understood uh, before any deal is, is presented. Which brings me to the second stage, the actual deal development, where we're talking about a specific uh, transaction opportunity. And during the deal process, there will be many experts involved in valuation, negotiation, and due diligence, and there can be a tendency to defer to the experts. But directors need to understand the basics of each of these areas of expertise in order to ask the right questions and ultimately to approve the deal or not. They don't have to be an expert. But, for example, in the valuation process, uh, there should be a focus on the potential to create value with the deal, not just on the value of the target companies. Directors can, can look for that in the valuation, and directors need to probe hard on synergy claims to distinguish real potential from wishful thinking, and they have to understand enough about valuation in order to understand whether the synergy claims are being being supported appropriately. Um, due diligence is often too focused on just confirming the numbers. Directors need to understand enough about due diligence to push the boundaries of the due diligence to ensure there is due diligence on, for example, the health of the operations, uh, retention risks, uh, corporate culture issues, uh, and the quality of post-deal implementation plans. The third stage is post-deal implementation. Uh, after the deal is actually when the value is created and where most deals fail, quite frankly, and we'll uh, possibly come back to this. Uh, directors need to understand how value will be created, where the risks lie, and they need a window on the progress of implementation, not just the steps, but also on the outcome. So those are some of the things, some of the concepts that every director needs to understand from the beginning, M&A strategy, right to the end, post-deal implementation. 
Thank you, Ken. And can you also discuss with us how M&A and fiduciary responsibility intersect in the boardroom and affect the company and its officers? Uh, great question. The fiduciary responsibility of directors demands great care and attention in the in M&A uh, for three reasons. Uh, first, the strategic nature of transactions. Um, the board is ultimately responsible for the direction of, of the company, and M&A is increasingly playing a key role in strategy. So M&A oversight is a key part of strategy oversight. In addition, unanticipated M&A transactions have sometimes taken companies off course. So approval of a deal can be, in effect, an abandonment of an approved strategy. So, in, so directors' responsibility for strategy oversight implies strongly an oversight responsibility for M&A. Uh, secondly, um, the high, it's the high stakes, and uh, I mentioned this earlier. On the buy side, acquisitions can involve spending 10% to up to even 100% of the company's value in cash or stock. Most significant transactions require board approval or even shareholder approval. And on the sell side, the sale of the company offers to shareholders a one-time value in cash or stock ending perhaps decades or even centuries of development of the company as an independent entity. This is a big deal. The board is always front line for these ill decisions to recommend or not the tendering of the shares uh, to an offer. The third reason, and this should get everybody's attention, and it comes out of the first two, but it's the liability risk. Large M&A transactions almost always generate legal actions by shareholders that directors may have to defend. Did they sell for too little? Did they pay too much? Were they conflicted? Were they naive in accepting advisor accounts of valuation and due diligence? Did they miss a hidden liability in the deal? Why did implementation not deliver? Now, D&O insurance can protect directors to some degree, but the insurance doesn't respect directors' reputation, and a bad deal uh, can ruin a reputation and end a director career. Thank you. And can you also discuss with us the current iterations and best practices around a company's decision process when discussing a potential acquisition and the role a board and its members play in the process? Uh, sure. What I'll do is I'll, I'll refer back to those three stages that I mentioned earlier, strategy, uh, deal development, and post-deal implementation. And uh, I'll, I'll talk about what's typical and also the best practices. And typically, the board is only involved in, the, in that middle stage, over, oversight of deal development, the valuation, negotiation, due diligence, and, and approval. Board approval is usually required for a significant transaction, so management has no option to be involved in that stage of the process. However, best practice boards are involved throughout the process, as mentioned earlier, from strategy to implementation. And they play a deeper role in the deal development stage than is, uh, than is typical. So let me illustrate uh, some of the best practices uh, stage by stage. In M&A strategy, uh, the emerging best practice in strategy development involves the board throughout the strategic planning process, not just in the approval of, of the strategic plan. The NACD recently released a major paper on this, in fact. So, uh, now, in my view, you know, management needs to own the plan and they should run the process. However, if the board is only brought in at the end for approval, that's too little and too late. It's too little because there's too little time in a strategy review or even a workshop to truly understand the strategy and all the work that's been done up to that point in time and the context uh, to do a proper job. And it's too late because when it's all done and we're ready to put it in a binder, that's no time or it's not the most constructive time, certainly, to... Um, to ask fundamental questions about, you know, are we covering the right geographies? 
did we consider the right options? Um, so what should happen here is involvement throughout the process where the directors are engaged at key points, not running the process, as I mentioned. I think management should run the process and, and, and own the strategy in the end. Uh, but directors could be involved early to ensure the right issues are on the table, e.g., is this an industry that's restructuring, uh, very relevant to the M&A subject, um, to offer input on the options being considered, including the M&A option, to encourage appropriate risk-taking in a, in a restructuring industry. It may be the highest risk not to be a player in M&A. In the second stage, as I mentioned, uh, directors are involved by necessity. However, it's very challenging in deal development. Uh, there is a lot of work to be done, often under extreme time pressure. And, you know, frankly, the board can get in the way of a deal uh, if, um, if, they're, if the entire board is trying to be brought along at every step. The best practice in deal development is, in the deal development stage, is to form a special committee or a deal committee that will be more closely involved than the rest of the board. So deal committees typically include directors with M&A experience. However, I also recommend inclusion of at least one skeptic about this, this particular deal and one non-expert. Otherwise, there's some risk that the committee can kind of go native with the rest of the M&A experts and the remainder of the board is no better off. Uh, ultimately, uh, the formation of the committee does not relieve any director of his or her fiduciary responsibilities. So each director must understand the deal in his or her own terms in order to approve it. In uh, post-deal implementation, uh, as I mentioned, this is where most deals that fail, uh, fail in the implementation stage. I've done post-deal audits that consistently show a third to a half of the plans for value creation were not implemented. Yet most boards view the implementation stage as an operational issue and don't think they have a role to play. Now, clearly, this falls short of exercising fiduciary responsibility. So the best practice boards here insist on regular reporting of progress and key implementation metrics until the promised value is captured. In other words, uh, it's not over until the value is created. It's not the closing of the transaction that, um, that ends the board's involvement. So what types of questions should a director ask to continue to maintain their fiduciary responsibility in regards to M&A decisions? Uh, one could write a list of questions. It would be a long list. Um, but frankly, I'm not a fan of lists of anything when it comes to good governance because there's no list that can replace good judgment. And asking a list of questions can be a cop-out in a way to true understanding. So the best questions for directors to ask are whatever the questions are that they need answered in order to understand the deal from their own perspective. What I mean by that is the questions that a CA on the board or a lawyer or a former CEO that knows the industry or a politician or even a school teacher on the board will need to ask will be different. However, their duty is the same. Each must understand the, the deal from their own perspective, and they need to discuss it thoroughly to understand each other's perspectives and collectively make a decision in the best long-term interests of the, of the company. Each director from their own perspective and skill set can follow the stages of the deal from strategy to implementation, as we, as we discussed earlier and ask the questions that will permit them to exercise informed judgment. So for a CEO or CFO tasked with presenting M&A issues and opportunities to the board, what are some strategies for communicating these concepts to other directors with different backgrounds and expertise? I have to say, first of all, um, and I've seen so many massive, complex presentations go to boards on, uh, on M&A transactions. So the first tip I would offer is, in short, 
less is more. The fundamentals of any deal can be explained in plain English with limited technical detail and not so many PowerPoint exhibits. For example, the M&A strategy, the rationale for this particular combination, the key sources of value, the price range and rationale, and the implementation challenges and risks are seldom technical and need not be voluminous, even for large transactions. Now, having said that, the devil may lie in the detail. That's the role of the deal committee. With greater M&A knowledge and deeper engagement, the deal committee can dig in as needed to understand and challenge some of the more technical matters in valuation and due diligence. The deal committee can then bring back important findings to the full board, explained in terms that all will understand. Are there any red flags that directors should be aware of when analyzing a company's M&A initiatives and standards? Well, I've, I've alluded to some of them um, in, the, in the conversation up till now. Um, so maybe what I could do now is, is note kind of by stage a few things that had they been noticed – would have prevented disasters. So in the M&A strategy stage, um, the first red flag is the company doesn't have an M&A strategy. Now, this is common, which is surprising, considering uh, how much M&A activity is underway. But a lot of companies view the M&A activity as separate from strategy. They shouldn't. Uh, It's particularly concerning um, if you don't see an M&A strategy in an industry that's undergoing significant change. And I don't know of any industries not undergoing significant change, by the way. Uh, Second red flag in strategy is when the strategy only considers acquisitions and not divestitures. So in this case, there is an M&A strategy, but it's just saying, here's what we're going to buy. Companies that don't consider the sell side often drag along underperforming assets or uh, they find themselves surprised by a takeover offer uh, that they they just hadn't considered that somebody could be buying them. The best acquirers, uh, perhaps ironically, are always buying as well as selling. In the deal development stage, the first red flag, and I would say the brightest red, is a management team that is absolutely convinced that we absolutely have to do this deal. Red flag. Uh, Egos, emotions, and excitement are all heightened in an M&A context, and people lose their independent judgment. The second red flag is if we get to due diligence and it's considered a foregone conclusion. Due diligence should not be a rubber stamp. Many deal failures and, I would add, director liabilities could have been prevented in the due diligence phase. It should be taken seriously. There should be a willingness to accept a change in the deal terms or even a willingness to walk away from a deal based on due diligence findings. And if you're not in that frame of mind, that's a red flag. The third red flag in the deal development stage is not seeing convincing implementation plans. You'll sometimes see some vague references or or you'll hear that implementation planning will be done later. Directors should be very skeptical of a claim of value creation if they can't see through to how that value will actually be created. So when I don't see a plan, I kind of wonder how credible the claims are for value creation. And if the claims are credible, how hard is it to outline the plan to achieve them? Which that ties into uh, the the third stage, the post-deal implementation stage. Um, The first red flag there is when, after the closing party, there's a sense of over to you folks uh, where the senior management team and the corporate development folks basically hand this off to an implementation team. Sloppy handoffs are common. There is a lot of money at stake and a difficult task at hand. 
It should be a major focus of the senior management team for some time. Now, granted, they have to bring other, in other people. Uh, the post-deal implementation can involve a lot of people, uh, but senior management should be on top of it until the implementation is complete. The final red flag I'll mention, and this should be very evident at the, uh, at the board table, is when the board returns to business as usual. Uh, after the scurrying around of, around the transaction, at the next board meeting, it's, it's back, back to the usual agenda. In fact, the deal should be taking time on the board agenda until the promise value is demonstrably achieved. We don't do business as usual until the deal has been fully implemented and the board has visibility on the value. Excellent. And before we wrap up our interview, do you have any closing thoughts that you would like to add? I think it's great that you're that you're bringing this uh, to everyone's attention, Rachel. This is an important uh, important responsibility of boards. M&A activity is increasing, and many boards aren't playing the role uh, that they should. Uh, so directors. Uh, Oversight responsibility from M&A strategy right through to implementation calls on directors to be engaged, and they can make a difference in these high-risk and hopefully high-reward transactions. This was the continuing board education segment on the board's role in M&A strategy and decision-making with Ken Smith. Thank you so much, Ken, for your time and thoughts today. Happy to be here.